Welcome back all. Our afternoon, uh, our, our, our afternoon, well, I guess we're still morning, it's okay. Uh, anyway, so our next speaker is Jamie Goodall, who uh, I was incorrect. She's at the, she's now at the US Army Center of Military History. She'll be speaking about what's sometimes called the golden age of piracy in a global context. And uh, she just recently published a book, The Pirates of the Chesapeake Bay, From the Colonial Era to the Oyster Wars. And uh, I, I also have, uh, there's, there's rumors of more, uh, of more piratical works uh, that are in the offing as well. So we're looking forward to those also. So with that, I will turn things over to Jamie. All right, uh, I'd like to thank Crystalyn and Ian for inviting me to be part of such a wonderful project and to the Maine Historical Society for hosting us this morning. I also want to apologize in advance. I'm having some internet trouble, so Zoom has been kicking me out. But if it does, just know I'll be back really quickly. So I'll be speaking to you this morning about the ways in which pirates disrupted and contributed to the greater Atlantic world, particularly economically and politically. So my research focuses on how pirates stealing, selling, and buying of commodities is integral to the broader history of early modern consumption and colonial expansion. And it is particularly apparent during the imperial crisis period, although my research really begins in about 1650. Um, these activities were important forms of economic and social engagement by individuals routinely believed to be disruptors of, not contributors to, socioeconomic activity. To do this, I examined the development of commercial stability throughout the Atlantic world, particularly the islands of the Caribbean in what I call economies of opportunity. Uh, these are the legally blurred opportunistic commercial exchanges between state and non-state actors. Uh, I argue that these economies of opportunity emerged in part because of the commodities and labor pirates brought to the islands in the Caribbean world, and also because of the incessant warfare of the period. So this helped to fuel the growth of the larger Atlantic economy in spite of such conflict. Pirate crews did everything from swigging beer at local taverns to patronizing victuallers, frequenting brothels to supporting laundresses. Sometimes they even purchased land or opened businesses with the loot gained from their illicit activities. They brought textiles, rum, wine, timber, enslaved peoples, specie, porcelain, earthen and tinwares, furniture, and more to the islands. In some ways, they stole what they believed would bring them a profit, large or small, but their exploits also helped to shape and drive consumer choices in the Caribbean by delivering goods that may or may not have been bound for a particular location. The influx of specie could also enable someone to purchase items or property they may not have otherwise been able to afford. Piracy is considered in conjunction with activities like smuggling, shipwrecking, and mercantile rivalries as part of a wider system of illicit commerce. The overlap between them is too great to see them as absolutes. This is an important expansion of our understanding regarding acts of piracy. When we recognize that illicit commerce was often subsumed under multiple categories, we increased our understanding of the significance to early modern economies of opportunity. In particular, my work focuses on a mix of islands under the often contested control of various European nations, particularly as a result of the crisis of the 1670s to 1720s. Taken together, these islands demonstrate how economies of opportunity developed and why these activities were important. We can also better understand the unbalanced nature of the economy in the wider early modern Atlantic world. Here, pirates help sustain the livelihood and stability of island inhabitants, especially when affected by strict embargoes. My work then necessarily centers on the economic relationship between pirates and several groups between the mid 17th and late 18th century, government officials, island inhabitants, individual traders, and major merchant companies, just to name a few. Pirates needed the cooperation of merchants, inhabitants, and government officials in order to be able to fence their stolen goods. They relied on complicity to resupply and repair their ships, and they hoped their connections with government officials would help them avoid imprisonment or the noose. In return for their support, pirates afforded the islands with economic and physical security, and major merchant companies could rely on pirates to help ebb competition. Economies in the Caribbean and the wider Atlantic faced bouts of precariousness. Routine warfare, shifting tides of the market, and the threat of bad seasons left islands to fend for themselves. The subject of piracy has often been viewed in a national or imperial framework, with a focus on how their activities affected the coffers of the English, 
the European mainland and North America. Examining pirates and nations in isolation obscures the fact that the Atlantic world was home to a complex web of commercial networks affected by the imperial crisis, and that pirates were often multinational and multi-ethnic crews with fluid allegiances. Doing so also fails to explain how pirates and smugglers were able to permeate the communities of the Caribbean world and their crucial place in colonial survival during frequent times of upheaval. So essentially for this project, I'm taking the golden age of piracy and what we consider to be um, really the, the main crux of piracy in the Atlantic world. And it fits very neatly into this um, great upheaval that we're talking about um, because they are disruptors of economic and political activity. Um, they are contributing to the crisis of the time period. But I also wanted to expand that to include their contributions. So this is just sort of a broad overview of my work. I didn't want to get into too much specifics today, um, just in case people were unfamiliar with the, the overview. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Ian. All right. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, so uh, I am going to uh, deliver our last of the topical uh, uh, talks, and then we will move on over to an all group discussion. So let me just pull up my own uh, notes here. All right. So my topic uh, of everybody here is is really uh, in some ways the most straightforward uh, to deliver because uh, what became the state of Maine was the scene of arguably the most concentrated uh, scenes of, of, of violence and, uh, and, and refugee crises of, of almost anywhere in the, in the Atlantic world. And so, and uh, even though this, uh, these events took place in what became uh, primarily in what became Maine, uh, as well as, as neighboring states and Canadian provinces, um, during the per time period of the Great Upheaval, most of this uh, this place was uh, was known by its uh, its inhabitants, uh, the people who own the land, uh, the Wabanakis, as as the Dawnland. And so, uh, but of all the of all the panelists, my my task is sort of the most straightforward in that regard, uh, because very much the the Wabanaki uh, homeland was just almost constantly this cauldron of border crises and wars and, and violent outbreaks. And so I'm going to talk a bit about those and why that was and how that relates to our themes, as well as how some of the, the MHS collections uh, can help us learn more about these as well. So between 1675 and 1725, four different wars raged in this northern New England area over at least portions of 33 calendar years. And these conflicts uh, became popularly known as King Philip's War, which began in 1675 and ended in, in, the, uh, in Northern New England in 1678. Then there was another uh, between 1688 and 1699, the, uh, a second conflict broke out between the Wabanakis and the English speaking colonists and a number of French speaking colonists as well. And then a third war broke out in 1703 and lasted a decade. Europeans called it the War of Spanish Succession for some of those dynastic reasons that Craig was talking about. And then finally, a fourth uh, period of bloodshed broke out uh, expl explicitly in uh, North America again, which uh, doesn't have a single name, but is most commonly known as Dummer's War after the acting governor of Massachusetts. Some Mainers actually called it uh, Lovell's War after a, uh, an unsuccessful scalp hunter uh, was, was killed in battle in 1725. Uh, he, was, he was deemed as something of a local hero. And so this conflict was named after him by some of these, uh, these English speaking inhabitants. So um, all of this, this bloodshed stemmed from local, regional, as well as Atlantic factors. Previous scholars have differed in terms of which factors they emphasize the most. Uh, key to explaining 
why, though, that this region uh, experienced war as the usual state of affairs is the often relatively even balance of power between antagonists and the just diverse range of outsiders with an interest in what went on in, uh, in this region. So with the benefit of hindsight, there's something of a, uh, a symmetry in the narrative of the great upheaval in the Dawnland. So the most pressing local problem stemmed from the refusal of English speaking colonizers to abide by 17th century reciprocal agreements between Wabanakis and early arrivals. And so uh, up until about 1675, smaller groups of, of English colonizers by and large paid Wabanakis for the privilege of, of living in the Dawnland. And so, uh, but by uh, these, these early agreements, often in the form of land deeds, allowed the newcomers to live in the Dawnland in exchange for their participating in reciprocal relationships in acknowledging Wabanaki sovereignty over all but a narrow strip of uh, the coast in present day Maine. Uh, events took a turn uh, for the worse by 1675. Increasingly, uh, New England colonists, uh, including Mainers, became uh, less willing to to treat uh, their indigenous neighbors as, as equals in any, in any regard. And so what began in Southern New England, a conflict known as King Philip's War, uh, spread to Northern New England because uh, Maine towns became uh, terrified. They were afraid that the, uh, that the Wabanakis were going to join their Algonquin speaking relatives to the South and killing all the English. And so New Englanders uh, in, in uh, uh, dealing with the Wabanakis increasingly demanded they turn over all their weapons. They also increasingly stopped honoring reciprocal agreements, for example, paying annual tribute for the privilege of living on their land. Um, and so by, uh, by 1675, the Wabanakis in what became Maine had had enough as well with this. And so some of them gradually, since they were treated as enemies, behaved like it. And so the war spread to Northern New England. And while it lasted only about a year in Southern New England, uh, killing thousands of people, in Northern New England, the conflict dragged on until 1678. And the difference was that uh, in this case, the, uh, the indigenous side did considerably better. The Wabanakis won their war against Massachusetts, which claimed Maine at this point. And so one of, the, one of the sources we have on that conflict, uh, you can actually find in the MHS collections. There's a very rare, uh, it's a, the only copy that exists of it, the, the Scott Howe Journal of 1677, describing negotiations between uh, colonial leaders and some of the Wabanakis after a series of unsuccessful campaigns by the English in the region. And so in 1678, uh, the English agreed that if they were going to return to what's now Maine, that they would pay an annual tribute. Every family would pay an annual tribute and a certain number of bushels of corn for the privilege of being there. Now, after only a few years, the, the colonists once again stopped honoring these pledges. And so by 1688, the Wabanakis, uh, instead casting about for new allies, uh, allied with the neighboring French in, uh, in what's now Quebec. And so the, the Wabanakis allied with the French Empire and uh, with them launched a series of attacks on the New England frontier and once again enjoyed considerable military success. So in both King Philip's War and this, uh, uh, what Europeans called the Nine Years War and what some colonists called King William's War after their monarch at the time. Uh, these two conflicts resulted in the destruction of most main towns. Uh, what became the city of Portland was burned to the ground in 1676 and then once again in 1691. And so uh, the English retaliated and a number of indigenous communities were destroyed as well. And so the result of this nine years war was an extremely bloody draw 
uh, a series of epidemics raced through both uh, the English and the, uh, the indigenous communities in New England. But the Wabanakis were, were hit particularly hard. They might have lost as many of a third of their population in the 1690s to a great smallpox epidemic. So the Wabanakis, one of the things that, this, uh, that drove this is the Wabanakis gradually changed their strategy in dealing with the, the newcomers. And so they had initially been trying to incorporate the English into these reciprocal relationships. Uh, when that failed, they then turned to the use of force to drive the English out of what the Wabanakis called the common pot, referring to the, the fact that they shared this, uh, this space with a finite number of resources uh, and overlapping use networks. And so everybody had to respect the reality that we all share this common pot. And so since the English had shown they could not partake in the common pot uh, and be trusted, uh, the Wabanakis turned to force to try to drive them out of it. Uh, by the end of the 1690s, they had enjoyed some success, although at great cost. Uh, but then what happened was, is soon after a, a truce, the Wabanakis once again uh, joined, in this case, a European war in 1703, supporting their, uh, their previous French allies as another war between colonial powers and Europe broke out. And so in order to, to shore up their American alliances, the Wabanakis were willing to fight on the side of the French in a, uh, what for them was the third war against New England. And they again attacked the handful of the remaining uh, English communities in, in Maine at this point. Uh, and that war dragged on uh, for a decade. Uh, and so by this point, most English colonists and Wabanakis who had lived in what became the state of Maine were by 1713 living someplace else. Uh, in the case of the Wabanakis, usually this was along the St. Lawrence Seaway and what's now Quebec or in other communities in the, in the Canadian Maritimes. In the case of the English speaking colonists, everybody east of Wells had abandoned their communities by 1713 with almost no significant exceptions. Uh, this had contributed to a flood of refugees going back into Massachusetts and elsewhere in New England and contributing in, uh, among other ways, to the Salem witch craze of 1692, which was sparked, uh, arguably at least in part, by this flood of refugees from the northern New England frontier into Essex County, which is where Salem was in 1692. So by 1713, everybody was living uh, the majority of, of the residents of the Dawnland had been displaced. And so by 1713, the Wabanakis switched their strategy yet again. And so they decided that since uh, full reciprocal incorporation of the newcomers had not worked, and since uh, dramatic use of force had not produced uh, a lasting victory, then the third option that the Wabanakis settled on was containment. And so what they decided to do is they stopped acknowledging any new land sales with the English and they insisted uh, again and again in a series of treaties that the English colonial officials needed to draw a firm boundary and stick to it. And the basis of this boundary was that the Wabanakis would acknowledge earlier land sales in exchange for the English colonists uh, respecting indigenous rights to unsold land. And so that, uh, that basis became uh, the potential for a new peace. But before that happened, a series of uh, ambitious land speculation companies, including the Pajepska proprietors, whose papers are in the main historical societies, uh, they essentially willfully tried to uh, change the translation of earlier agreements in which the Wabanakis had invited the English to live on what they called all lands formally settled. The uh, speculators interpreted this to mean not physically occupied, but rather any territory that had been uh, purchased on even the flimsiest excuse, even in a, a not particularly well acknowledged deed. And so these companies like the Pajepska proprietors began to construct new towns in places that none had existed before, in places like Brunswick, Maine, it was the largest and most important of those, where uh, Bowdoin College is today. And so when the Wabanakis complained about these uh, encroachments and aggressions, the uh, successive governors of 
of Massachusetts and the other, the other colonies in New England said that they had no power to interfere in private land sales. And so as a result of, uh, of rising uh, tensions over this, this encroachment, uh, a war that m both sides didn't, almost nobody really wanted a war, but one broke out anyway in 1722. Uh, I should be clarified that uh, the English didn't want to fight for indigenous land. Uh, they wanted the land, they just didn't want a war for it. Uh, so we should not, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to have this sort of false equivalence here in terms of the, the sources of colonization. So this fourth war, uh, which again is going to be the subject of a future project of my own. Uh, the working title is uh, The War with Too Many Names, uh, because there are too many of them and none of them are good. Okay, but this conflict, uh, variously known as Dummer's War or, or Lovell's War or Father Rawls War, depending on who you ask, uh, it dragged on for several years and it was, uh, it, it proved to be uh, most sides considered, most participants viewed it as a disaster. The speculators, like the Pajepska proprietors, uh, believed that their investments were being ruined. The Massachusetts Bay Colony believed that it just didn't, it couldn't afford any more uh, to, to fund any more soldiers after these decades of conflicts fighting the French and other indigenous people. And the Wabanakis themselves failed to score uh, meaningful military victories. And so uh, what happened was, is that in a series of negotiations between 1725 and 1727, which have collectively become known as Dummer's Treaty, the mutually exhausted uh, antagonists settled down and uh, hacked out a, a surprising feature, and that is a, a treaty that the, uh, the English colonizers generally respected. And this was a, a, a reasonably successful treaty of peace. And uh, the copies, various copies of Dummer's Treaty and its negotiations between 1725 and 27 can be found, uh, including with some marginalia from some of their owners in the Maine Historical Society collections. And so by 1727, the Wabanakis feel that the, their French allies who refused to help them in this fourth war, because there was no war in Europe, the French had abandoned them, and that therefore the Wabanakis had to seek a more negotiated uh, arrangement with the, with the English colonies because they could not trust the French uh, to be reliable military allies to keep the, the British back. And so they once again uh, agree to make sort of, uh, to draw a line uh, between the, uh, the English holdings and the Wabanaki Dawnland. They selectively acknowledged a few more uh, contested land deeds uh, and in exchange, they insist that certain other, uh, in this case, they were, they generally, there were a handful of fraudulent deeds and other bad faith agreements. And so the Wabanakis insisted that these claims would be disavowed and that in the future, if any speculator showed up with deeds that they could not verify and with claims that could not be proved, that the Massachusetts Bay Colony would side with the indigenous people in these disputes. And because the speculators uh, who made an appearance at these negotiations believed that this treaty validated their earlier purchases, they became devoted backers of this negotiated settlement and its enforcement. And so after 1727, this period of, of, almost, uh, of, of seemingly almost unbroken warfare wound down. So, what can we take away from this? Uh, and the first is that uh, what we see in, in places like uh, Northern New England and the Canadian Maritimes is we see local concerns layering over with the concerns of European empires, as well as, and I should add, uh, refugees from other regions, in this case from Southern New England, King Philip's War. And what we also see is this phenomenon of, of violence and instability be getting more violence and instability. And then finally, uh, we should add that these, these different events uh, going on outside of, uh, of the Dawnland profoundly shaped it in the sense that the, uh, the British victories and their wars against the French made the French uh, less able to support their Wabanaki allies. Okay, 
Uh, and yet, meanwhile, what we also see is that even as certain uh, outside imperial actors like the British Empire rose in power, this did not mean that they uh, that they were able to successfully control everything that was going on in their colonies overseas, and certainly not the uh, the actions of indigenous people living outside of their imperial control. And so, with that, I'm going to stop. And so. We will uh, we'll take another very brief intermission, and at noon, all of the panelists will will uh, will convene all at once, and we will take your questions and we will respond to to, to some some others raised by these talks, uh, and we will see what we can't make of this great upheaval. Good to have everybody back for our now afternoon panel. Uh, so we got a number of great questions um, already lined up from the, from the audience. And so there were a couple of really uh, big, uh, important ones that, that were addressed that uh, Crystal and I were gonna, were gonna take right off. Uh, and there were some other, uh, I think some other really uh, thoughtful questions directed at some of the panelists that we'll, that we'll get to as well. Uh, but so Crystal, do you wanna, do you wanna go first regarding uh, regarding the point you were going to make. Certainly. So I wanted to uh, right off the bat get into um, what Daniel Mandel was asking and appreciate that that question. Um, in terms of, of dealing with what's going on in the Lower South and what's going on in the, the Chesapeake in re regards to Native uh, slavery and African slavery, I think it's a yes and uh, response. Uh, and certainly today I tried to take the time to focus a little bit more on what's going on with the upheaval of the trade uh, for Native peoples uh, and what's going on in the interior. But it's certainly in a very, very important uh, component of what I intend to be doing with my component of the, the novel, um, the novel, <laughs> the monograph. <laughs> but turning into one of my students here um, in, with the monograph. But, you know, when we take a look at what's happening and taking it back just a little bit into the 1660s, you know, what's happening with the overproduction of tobacco, uh, what's happening with the destruction of Virginia ships, uh, thanks to uh, the Anglo-Dutch wars, uh, we can, can certainly look at two various, you know, stories that are intertwining with each other, but it's at times uh, diverging upon different paths. And when I think of what's going on and what gets lost in the discussion frequently is the native component, which is why I chose today to try to focus a little bit more on what's going on uh, with, with native slavery um, within Virginia and within the native South. You know, when we take a look at the codification and escalation of the African slave trade, especially when we start to see the Royal African Company start to be dismantled, uh, and we see the rise of the, the plantation economy. What has happened in the past, but certainly with a breadth of scholarship more recently, we start to see you know, what the native slave trade brought to that plantation economy. And so yes, this is absolutely an escalation of the African slave trade. It's absolutely a codification of, of racial uh, binaries. Um, but what we also see is that when we're taking a look at one particular zone, we have a tendency to obscure other zones. And so I think that one of the ways that would be really, really important to be able to tie this down into the, the South Atlantic as well um, is to be able to connect to where those slaves are being sold, those native slaves are being sold. Uh, throughout the Caribbean. What's happening in the Caribbean? I think uh, Vincent Brown's uh, Techies Revolt, his recent book, um, and the ways in which that we can connect the Chesapeake to the greater Native South and then taking that Native South down into the Southern Atlantic as well. So I'll cede my time over to Ian if he's got ideas too. <laughs> So thanks, yeah. And just building on that, and so to speak to other aspects of uh, the parameters of the slave trade and slavery, okay, as well as sort of wider geographical questions. And so today's talks were by no means uh, the, the exclusive parameters of this project, which is going to have about a dozen contributors. And so uh, absolutely, uh, the 
th this period of time set the stage for the, the true peak in the volume of the transatlantic slave traffic. Uh, and, uh, and so that was in part uh, enabled by uh, or, or shaped by the results of some of these wars. Uh, but what we also see during this time is uh, in, in terms of this is when uh, the Caribbean in particular, uh, most of the major islands fundamentally decisively make the shift to majority uh, non-white unfree labor. Uh, and certainly, uh, certainly uh, colonizers were, were using uh, slaves of African descent uh, as well as, uh, as Native Americans uh, from the, from the, well, actually from the 1400s on uh, at various points in time, but certainly this process decisively turns towards the, the sort of uh, real peak in the, the sort of global sugar plantation above all slave labor complex in the Caribbean, but also uh, by the early 18th century in the, in the Carolinas and in other parts of the Gulf of Mexico as well. And so that is definitely going to be a, a part of this volume. It, it, it would not be a complete project if we did not address that. Uh, but we're also speaking of, uh, of, of African people and polities as actors as well as, as certainly victims. And so a great model for our work would be uh, Vincent Brown has a great new book out about Tacky's Revolt, uh, a, a, uh, an attempted uh, revolution in Jamaica in the 1760s, okay, by enslaved, uh, by enslaved Jamaicans. And so uh, one of the things that this new wave of scholarship is doing has been connecting the, uh, the experience of, of enslaved Africans and their struggles for liberation and their running away and its impact on uh, on wider questions of sort of, of the rise and fall of political states right? and these greater questions of, of economics in this Atlantic world. And then uh, a second point on parameters and then I will, then we'll, then we'll move on. And so uh, Casey Schmidt asked uh, early on about the parameters uh, geographically when we're talking about a British or North Atlantic framework that often ignores the Iberian or South Atlantic. And so I think that's, uh, that's a wonderful point Right, and so uh, first of all, we definitely are aware of and don't want this to be uh, a sort of Anglophone exclusive story, right? And even though one of the results we would argue of the great upheaval is that by 1725, uh, the British Empire, uh, right, and sort of Anglophone peoples have achieved a level of sort of maritime and economic dominance that they never had before at the expense of the French, the Spanish, the Dutch, that doesn't mean that there were not all of these non-English speaking players involved, right? Uh, and I'm using Anglophone uh, very knowingly just because when we talk about the British Empire, there are Scots and uh, Moravians and uh, French refugees and enslaved Africans and free people of color and all these other folks, not just from Britain, who are participating in this British imperial project to some degree or another. And the only thing, uh, race doesn't unite them, right? Uh, religion doesn't unite them. And so if the only thing, so Anglophone is the crudest, best, you know, most accurate label we can give to this entity while being as inclusive as possible. So that said, right, um, one notable exception should be Portugal wasn't having a bad time. And so to just uh, give a quick note here. And so uh, if we were gonna try and shoehorn Portugal into an imperial crisis, uh, the Portuguese king was thrilled because somebody found gold and diamonds in Brazil and he got to build a lot of monasteries. And by and large, the Portuguese stayed out of everything. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. But in terms of uh, South Atlantic and Latin America, certainly the northern frontier of New Spain, and we're also looking into, there's apparently a lot more going on in what became, well, what was even then, Mexico. And so that is, that is going to play a role in this, this narrative as well. Um, but uh, Casey's point is, is very well taken, that this Atlantic framing of ours is meant to be uh, broadly inclusive and we're not going to, uh, while the focus will be on the Caribbean, the North Atlantic, and then the parts of, of North America 
that were most affected by this Atlantic Basin. That doesn't mean that we're, we're gonna be ignoring things that happen, for example, on the, on the Panama Isthmus uh, or even uh, elsewhere in Latin America. And so the, the, two, uh, the two scholars that Casey mentioned in her comments, I'm actually not familiar with, because uh, I'm, I'm apparently not up on them. And so if Crystal wants to say anything a little more about that, uh, I, will, I will let her do so. Ian, I'll be um, unprepared in terms of, of New England, but to, to answer a slavery question real quick, um, Elizabeth asked a, an interesting question as she has been reading closely Lisa Brooks' um, work on New England. And I can speak to my work in the Chesapeake um, before feeding over to Celine, who can probably answer a little bit more about what's happening up north. Uh, in terms of where are people being sold, uh, both they're being sold to plantations in Virginia, but they're also being sold to the Sugar Islands uh, as well. Uh, and in terms of indigenous perspectives, I worked closely uh, with the Virginia Council of Indians when it was uh, in existence for the state of Virginia, and I worked to, to try to incorporate Native voices as much as possible. I have a story. Um, the Nanzatico uh, were enslaved as punishment. The town was enslaved as punishment. Uh, and the children were parceled out to Virginia uh, colonists in, in high positions and the adults were sent to the Sugar Islands. But there's a story from the Rappahannock um, that not all were enslaved. Um, so there's a, a running oral history uh, through the 19th and into, into the present day from the Rappahannock claiming the Nanzetico as uh, part of their ancestors. Um, and so I think it's really important at all times to, to speak to and to include um, indigenous uh, oral histories uh, in our research to not only privilege the settler documents, to not only privilege uh, what we see as historians, but instead to include those native voices. And I think Lisa Brooks has done an excellent job uh, on that in the Northeast. And Celine, you, I interrupted you, so I'll shut up now. <laughs> no, 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 you're fine. <laughs> it was, uh, thank you. No, just a couple of extra, extra points. Uh, first to Casey's uh, comment, um, I wanted to point out that, you know, I said in my, in my talk that it's after 16, 60, particularly that the French Empire is really trying to expand around the Great Lakes and then south down the Mississippi. Um, it's the same time period when they're also reviving earlier attempts at settling in the Guianas area. So in what's today Guyana and, and Suriname. And so, and of course this is connected to their possessions in the Caribbean. So I, I didn't mention it in the specific, uh, you know, talk, but I'd be actually really interested in at least mentioning it uh, in what becomes a chapter, that this is part of a larger imperial expansion, uh, and it's absolutely connected to the South Atlantic. And the French, when they're thinking about settling in Louisiana and trying really to get a foothold on the Gulf of Mexico, of course, they are very well aware of what's going on with Spanish America how that would help them in confronting and challenging Spanish domination around uh, the Caribbean and, and South America as well. Uh, so all those projects are very connected in their minds, uh, in the policies, uh, and it has this impact as well. Um, the second quick point about slavery is that the French have also a habit of sending um, Adenashina captives to the galleys in the Mediterranean actually. So it's quite interesting because we have even uh, Cayuga, uh, you know, people who spent several years on Louis XIV's galleys in, um, in, in, the, in the Mediterranean and then return actually home and end up being kind of ambassadors slash spies, uh, you know, uh, for the French or for the English, depending. So, um, and, uh, but, but the French, of course, and, and that pressure that the French are putting in this area and all the, the, that exchange of captives that's going on, it's also a fine line between that and captives that are taking, taken for uh, the slave trade. Uh, and we know that the Fox particularly are really involved in uh, the slave trade. And I'm thinking about Brett Rushworth's work, of course, uh, about uh, the Indian slave trade um, in that region uh, and large amounts of Native people being sent to the Sugar Islands as well. So yeah, all those things are, um, very much uh, connected and important. 
no one minds, I'm going to just jump in briefly and say that I, I agree with a lot of the perspectives that were offered. Um, I wanted to make a quick note about slavery in the context of my own work. It's something that I didn't do a lot with in my dissertation when I wrote this project originally because in the 17th century, uh, Scots were largely excluded from the slave trade. It was sort of the wealthier, more regulated trade that the English sort of dominated. But by the time we get to the end of the Great Upheaval, um, the tobacco trade in Glasgow is the richest in the world and, of course, profiting on the backs of Virginia slavery. And so it's something that um, I've actually been engaging with a lot in contemporary context because the city of Glasgow is currently going through a bit of a, um, a, a, a I would describe it as a pretty uh, heated debate about renaming um, streets in the city that are named after tobacco lords, um, people who profited off of slavery. And it's been really interesting to see this conversation um, come up in the context of Scottish history because so little, uh, uh, other than some recent work on Scots in the Caribbean, so little people talk about Scots in relation to slavery. Um, and it's helpful um, to think about it as, a, as something that uh, we were, even though Scotland was a small kingdom, deeply intertwined in. Um, kind of going bigger than that, I was hoping to kind of make a comment in agreement, but also sort of expanding a little bit of what's been said in response to Casey Schmidt's question about the South Atlantic and its relationship to the Northern Atlantic. Um, it's possible I can say this because the period, the, the, the era that I'm talking about, quite literally, is the border between what we think of as the North and the South Atlantic in the Darien Esmiths. Um, like Celine, um, part of my research also ends up in Suriname, although in the Dutch portion, than, as opposed to the French. Um, uh, the question of slaving in the sense of taking slave ships into the West African region is also something that has increasingly come up in my work. But one of the things I'll just note here is that when I think about Atlantic per perspectives, when I think about what the Atlantic world is, I agree with the framing in your question, Casey, that it is very Anglophone um, and, ver and to use um, Ian's sort of the definition of that word, very sort of North American uh, dominated with obviously other components included. One of the things that I found in talking about Scotland, even though it is by any definition, uh, an Anglophone nation, an English speaking nation, thinking about them as a small country competing with not just the British, but also the French and the Spanish and to a lesser extent, the Dutch, they've had to, I've had to kind of confront the perspective of how they perceive Spain um, in relation to Britain, um, they see the Spanish as this behemoth, right? It's not this um, declining empire um, that's sort of out of date and sort of being vigorously overtaken by a Protestant, you know, uh, innovative Britain. But in fact, it's this huge threat and obstacle that looms over the question of um, colonization, empire trade. One of the things I talk a lot about in my work is the extent to which um, sort of memories of um, earlier eras of imperial religious conflict sort of shape actions in the 17th and 18th century. You know, people haven't forgotten that Philip II was a tyrant, right? Like they see the Spanish as absolutists, they see them as dangerous. So in the context of, um, for lack of a better way to put it, the South Atlantic, you know, it's interesting to see how people like the Scots in the 17th century are talking about Spain. They're talking about it as this kind of monolithic, all-powerful imperial space when of course, from reading documents and, and reading bo uh, books by scholars. One, one you mentioned uh, Fabrizio Prado, but you'll, I also think a lot about Ignacio Gallup Diaz at Bryn Mawr College. He actually wrote a great book on the Darien region and the Spanish politics of the era that I found incredibly useful because it was a nice counter to um, the monolithic view that British people have of Spain as this kind of, I said it a few times now, but um, you know, all powerful, dominant, tyrannical empire. And of course, in fact, once you start reading it, you realize there's all these negotiated, complicated relationships with the local people, with power structures in the era. So I just want to, I guess this is a long way of saying, I completely agree that having uh, a non-Anglophone, non-North Atlantic perspective on what Atlantic world history is, is absolutely valuable. And it's something that I found easier to do thinking about the Atlantic world from the perspective of not one of the major colonizers, but a small nation trying to figure out where it fits. Of course, that becomes part of the biggest group. So. Uh, the perspective sort of wanes over the course of the project, but it's a great question and I appreciate it. Thanks so much. We're getting a, a lot of them. I'm gonna give one quick answer because there are a number of, uh, of members of the public appear to have Scottish ancestry and are wondering about the Scots in Maine. Um, and so the, the sort of quick answer to this is that most of the, the Scots in Maine were the so-called Scots-Irish who were Scots who went to Ireland 
And then as Protestants in Ireland, to put it bluntly, did not have a good time there. And so a number of these people uh, eventually pulled up stakes and moved to the, the British uh, colonies in, in North America, uh, above all in places like Pennsylvania, North Carolina, but this also included uh, Maine, near what's near Arousic now today. Um, and there's, uh, unfortunately, I can't get too into the, the weeds in this, but there's basically, uh, it's a very mysterious area of colonization where these people showed up, they were invited by the speculators. And then because they had not paid the Indians any permission to any, any, uh, any tribute to be where they were, they were targeted during Dummer's War. And these towns, these Scots-Irish towns were destroyed. And these people scattered. And some of them stuck it out along the coast of Maine and others did not. But these people, you find traces of them in the records for several decades popping up in these other coastal towns saying, I used to live in Cork, which was an abandoned town in 1722. And so some of you guys who are, who are mentioning your, your Scottish ancestry or Scots-Irish, that's probably where it comes from if it goes that far back. Uh, somebody else? Yeah, Can I just make one, very, very one yeah. quick note on that? It's one of the interesting questions I get a lot about Scots versus Scots-Irish. Um, my own work, I've tried to lean more towards Scots because there's a lot of interest, a lot of work already done on what we think of as Scots-Irish, but disentangling them is complicated um, because as you rightly point out, um, some Scots lived in Scotland as children and moved to Ireland then the Americas. The, differ the differences I've found tend to be that the people we think of as Scots tend to be more... Um, for lack of a better way to put this sort of middling, middle class, um, whereas it's the poorer folks who tend to move to Ireland seeking land and then subsequently come to the colonies. And so the frontiers of various colonies are populated by a lot of Scots-Irish. But if you're looking for people who think of themselves as pure Scots in the colonies, they tend to live in places like Boston or Portland or in New Hampshire and Exeter. They were a big part of the early community there. Um, I was just going to make one brief note as well. There was a question by Jan McGowan about the prisoners of war at Dunbar. Um, a battle of Dunbar who moved and lived in Maine. Um, those are people that I would consider Scots because they lived in Scotland their whole lives and were sent over as prisoners of war by Cromwell. They're very much at the earliest edge of what I'm talking about, this kind of generation of Scots who find you know, the Stuarts to be sort of very objectionable and spend most of their lives fighting against them. Uh, I just think it's really interesting to think about how all these generations of people come over and how we define them, which is, you know, it's an ongoing project for me and it's something I talk about whenever this comes up and I, I really enjoy thinking about it, but um, the short answer is there isn't a clear, as Ian suggests, right, there's not a clear uh, and easy distinction, but you can usually find Scot people who call themselves Scots-Irish on the frontier. Great, thanks. Uh, and then to this other uh, really important question, uh, Ian Chambers wants to know uh, how, how those, this work will make this period a, a sort of early modern framing instead of a colonial framing. Um, and, and what does this mean? And that's a, that's a great question. And so uh, this, to, sort of, to clarify for those of you in the audience who might just not be up on this all the time, that's totally fine. And so uh, when scholars talk, when historians say that they're early modern historians and they usually mean around 1500 to around 1800, and this is kind of a global framing and it's not necessarily a, a sort of European centric or, or any sort of single nation centric way of framing, right? And it's not perfect, but it, it works pretty well. Uh, this is, a, and it's typified by this increased globalization of some European overseas empires, as well as some other global phenomenon we don't need to get into right now. Calling this the colonial period or something though, is a much narrower framing that risks becoming teleological where uh, where we're saying that all of this is just leading up to the American Revolution and the forming of the United States. And so by making this an explicitly early modern framing, which is something that we don't claim is particularly earth shattering for specialists necessarily, but definitely, you know, to be clear for the public, we want to make it clear that we're putting events and people that, that, that live in North America in uh, looking at them uh, at the same time and is interacting with the residents of the Caribbean and West Africa and Latin America and Europe. And we're not taking for granted uh, what we know did happen in the 1770s. And so instead of focusing on how can we figure out clues for how the United States came to be or look at what happened in the United States as we look at this broader context and restore some of the, the contingency and uncertainty uh, of history, as well as quite honestly, uh, in some ways, taking more seriously how these people saw their world. 
And so uh, we're very much doing that. Um, and so we're, uh, this is very much a, a, an early modern work um, and very much not a work of just sort of, sort of narrowly sort of colonial uh, history or something like that. Although certainly colonies play a role. Crystalline, did you want to take the, oh, sorry. No, she has something else you want to do. Okay, go for it. Yeah, go ahead. So I wanted to draw some of our other panelists into this, this discussion um, as well, because we had a really, really important question from Lafayette, and I apologize if I said your name wrong. <laughs> but, um, you know, when we think about this, we're, we're dealing with the reality of our sources. And the reality of our sources is, of course, that they are very Eurocentric. Um, I think in Virginia, I think of the example of the burned record counties where they basically say good luck um, because the records are destroyed. That's actually, I think, what the historical society says. There are counties where they literally write, yeah, good luck. Have fun with that. You're not going to find anything about this county. But when we have these fragmented sources and they are so Eurocentric, how do we talk about agency when we're, we're dealing with marginalized people? And instead of talking about uh, African peoples and, and native peoples as being objects and being acted upon, how do we, how would you in your individual chapters start to consider how do we create agency and how do we find the, those voices? Um, and can you think of some examples? Go. Um, I can sort of speak to that in my section. So what, what I didn't really delve into are the, the major realms of piracy that I look at. And I look at tavern culture, I look at shipwrecking, and I look at slavery. And not just the ways in which pirates participated actively in the transatlantic trade of enslaved peoples, but the ways in which they also freed enslaved peoples uh, and provided them the opportunity to either join a pirate crew, they provided them the opportunity to um, do what they wanted to, to the crew that had enslaved them, sort of giving them the agency to take back their, the ship and to, to do with that what they would. Um, in some cases, those enslaved, formerly enslaved Africans would go to these Caribbean islands and become Maroons. And so I, I work a lot with the Maroon communities in that aspect and, and the ways in which uh, enslaved peoples or free Blacks were able to create their own communities uh, as a result of piracy. So that's just a little bit about how my work kind of connects with that. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Uh, for for me, uh, Crystalline, I, f I feel like it's kind of a, a puzzle. It's like different pieces of the puzzle that we get. Um, thankfully, we have a lot of, like I said, we have very rich records around the piece, the great piece of Montreal. Uh, but what we can see, what we can do is look at some of the fears that the French are expressing about what they think our allies are doing and why they might switch alliances and not just the group in English but switch also among themselves we have a lot of kind of multilateral uh, and very complex native indigenous geopolitics here at, at play where um, they might you know try to ally with another more distant group to try to defeat another weaker group in the area even though they are all you know uh, allied to the French and, and the French are trying to protect those alliances. There's also different degrees of, of alliances that are going on because the French want to reconcile them with the, with the other national, but they also don't want them to become too friendly, right? Because then if they get access to Albany, if they are so friendly with the Confederacy, they can get access to Albany and then ally with the, with the English. So what we can do um, is look at the speeches, of course, the detailed speeches by indigenous people, oral histories collected usually much later in the 19th century, uh, current oral traditions that we still have as well, uh, but also see what happens afterwards. So we see some, including the Hurons, uh, kind of shifting, like using this new alliance, the Great Peace of Montreal, as a way to pressure the French into offering more trade goods to them. Uh, because now they can have access to uh, English goods, uh, you know, through, through their new partnership with the International Confederacy. So that can help us, again, putting all those pieces together can help us kind of uh, 
guess uh, a little more uh, what were the motives and the, the you know, the agendas uh, that some of those participants had. Um, definitely. Great, thanks. So we have, um, we have, uh, we have a, a number of other great questions we want to make sure we get to. So there's a, one about a disease, which I think Celine will also be able to, to help us on. But so uh, Margaret DeLacy wants to know, she says, the great upheaval is sandwiched between uh, two major episodes of plague in Europe, the great plague of London and the plague of Marseille. How does this, if at all, fit into the story? And so these, uh, these two plagues, it would be disingenuous for us to claim that the plague per se was a sort of you know, agent of, of the upheaval in the sense that it was new uh, because these, this great plague of London and the plague of Marseille were actually the two last really grim kind of, of outbreaks, large scale outbreaks of the bubonic plague in Europe. Um, and it went into decline for reasons we're not 100% sure on uh, in, in most areas where there, there's records. And so the plague itself wasn't new. But that said, um, certainly outbreaks like the plague of Marseille, and then there was a, a, a real terrible outbreak in France in the 1690s that might have killed like 10 or 15% of the population, combining with a famine. And there, of course, uh, uh, in, in the Wabanaki Dawn land, there were outbreak of smallpox. So disease was an aggravating factor. But uh, it is, sorry, I just derailed my own train of thought. Um, all right. So, but these, these particular plagues, right, are not uh, sort of new arrivals, we should, we should be clear, right? And um, they're just sort of one, uh, one addition of many. Uh, that said, they definitely, certain outbreaks of disease did have impacts in certain regions. And so, for example, in the Great Lakes interior, uh, which Celine was talking about. So I will, I will turn that over to her. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't have a whole lot to offer about that, but um, I guess it's a, it's an aggravating factor, like you said. Um, epidemics don't discriminate uh, discriminate uh, against people, so it affects pretty much everybody. So the colonists suffer from some of those epidemics as well. Uh, by the, the late 1600s, it doesn't have exactly the same effect on indigenous people as it had earlier in the colonial period, right, at, at first contact. But we still see some waves of epidemics really weakening some of those groups around the Great Lakes uh, and, and definitely becoming something that, uh, because of that devastation, that spurs uh, a need for more wars to acquire more captives, to adopt more people into indigenous groups, to kind of revitalize uh, demographically the, the communities. Uh, but also might create, I guess, that the demographic um, impact might also motivate it, people to ally again with the imperial powers uh, or with other indigenous groups and, and kind of create new entities and new leagues, uh, again, because they've been so weakened uh, just in, in mere uh, numbers, you know, in terms of mere numbers. So it is definitely a, a factor. Um, like you said, Ian, I don't think that we can directly connect what's going on with those two big plagues in Europe uh, to what's going on in the interior, uh, but it's definitely a fact of life during, during this entire period. Um, I just want to build off of that real quick. Um, there is actually an interesting parallel we can think about too, because I agree that the, the story of the plagues in Europe uh, and, and the indigenous story of plague is harder to pin down. But I, I was thinking about this this morning. I ended up not including it in my talk. Um, the Great Upheaval Era is the period in uh, John Robert McNeil's wonderful book, Mosquito Empires, where he describes a major outbreak of yellow fever in the Caribbean. Um, he has this great thesis about how prior to the outbreak around the 1680s, um, people like Oliver Cromwell could organize massive expeditions to Jamaica and conquer the island without any trouble because there was no real mosquito environment to worry about. Uh, and apologies, my puppy has woken up in the background. This is an ongoing uh, working from home problem I've got. So forgive me if that's quite loud. Um, by the 1680s, uh, you know, uh, Aegis Aegypti, the mosquito is so endemic and yellow fever is so widespread that, for example, when the British try to conquer, Cart uh, when the Spanish and the British fight at Cartagena, half their armies are wiped out by yellow fever. You know, same size of the armies, you know, 20 years apart, the mosquito environment is so much worse. Um, the Scots at Darien suffer from a massive yellow fever epidemic as well. 
that wouldn't have been the case or an issue um, for colonists, according to McNeil, 50 years before. So there is this kind of interesting environmental disease issue going on in the era. And it, it might be part of the explanation as to how imperial politics in places like the Caribbean are also sort of transformed by the environment in ways that maybe uh, I'm wishing I'd said more about because I need to think more about this then. Yeah, so I would point should... to, in terms of scholarship, I would point to Paul Kelton's excellent work on the smallpox epidemic um, of the late 17th century in the South. You know, when we, we think about the English settlements into the Chesapeake, you know, keeping in mind that, you know, Jamestown was an absolutely malarial swamp and a horrible place um, to live. And so part of the desire to move into the interior comes from a desire to move away from disease on the part of the settlers. And then, you know, Charleston is described as one of the worst places in the world to live um, because of yellow fever, because of malaria, because of the, the smallpox epidemics. Um, and so, you know, certainly we, we pay attention to, you know, where people are living, the fact that the vast majority of the plantations that are going to emerge are going to be absentee landowners in the Carolinas, uh, in part because of that disease environment. And so I would be really interested to, you know, that I'll be looking to explore, and I'm sure our other contributors who are working on Florida um, and the Carolinas will be contributing to as well. So we've had uh, the, the the questions keep coming in that are that are so uh, insightful, and so there's a there's kind of a two parter that I will touch briefly on, and then and turn things over uh, to to Jamie Goodall as well. And so the one of the questions was sorry I'm pulling it up again uh, about the the question of uh, environmental degradation resulting in colonial extraction of resources as well as so an environmental factor in this great upheaval uh, as well as the, uh, the consumer revolution factoring into this and so we don't have an explicitly environmental chapter straight away uh, and so uh, although the, the different scholars have been in, uh, I think in occasionally incorporating bits of those insights into their work uh, what it does make me think of and that it might be worth considering not just environment but also sort of climate this is the peak of the little ice age right uh, and this period of global cooling which is uh, which is uh, causing all kinds of agricultural disruptions and we uh, crystal and I were, were very cognizant where we didn't just want to make this a volume of oh look a bad thing is happening somewhere in the world so let's just chuck it all in here and say it's part of this upheaval and so that uh, that caution has led us to occasionally uh, perhaps be a bit choosy about uh, what we were including. Uh, but certainly uh, in terms of the environmental degradation, I think that's uh, above all something that our Caribbean chapters are gonna have to deal with in particular in terms of the, the ecologies and, uh, uh, and, and landscaping of those, those islands. Uh, but then in terms of the consumer revolution of factoring into this, I think that is, less of an issue of a consumer revolution uh, causing the upheaval, but rather the, the reverse, if anything, being more likely. And so I'll let Jamie speak to that as our resident uh, historian of consumerism here that is with us today. Okay, so I can speak a little bit about how it works within my own research. Um, so obviously with the consumer revolution, one of the ways that the gentry is setting itself apart is through the purchase and consumption and display of these goods. Um, but what I argue is that piracy, because of the disruptions of the great upheaval, so warfare, embargoes, um, things that might make uh, consumption of goods difficult is that pirates enabled people, not just the gentry, to participate in the consumer revolution. Um, because they're taking goods that are meant for certain locations or for certain people, and they're redistributing them to islands and to places that they might not have been meant for. Um, they're also selling them in a way uh, through, um, at taverns through uh, auction, so that people who didn't have the money to purchase certain kinds of goods now have an opportunity to do so. Um, one of the other things about the consumer revolution that I think is affected by the great upheaval is that 
it made printed materials more widely available. And in my work on tavern culture, one of the things that's really important is about the proliferation of newspapers throughout the Caribbean islands and the ways in which pirates are participating in the consumption of this printed material and how it enabled them to uh, get a better sense of what ships are going where and when and provided them sort of an opportunity to strategically target ships uh, in a way that that way they're not just out sailing around doing nothing and then coming upon a ship. They have a better idea of where to look for ships, what's on that ship, um, that sort of thing. So I would say I agree with Ian. I think that really the consumer revolution is shaped by the great upheaval as opposed to shaping the great upheaval. Uh, did uh, Craig, did you have anything you wanted to add about the consumer revolution? So I haven't I haven't engaged as much with the term as Jamie, so I don't want to I don't want to um, claim to be an expert um, on consumerism. But one of the things I will say is that um, I've been working for a little while on the idea that um, a majority, and this this I think does kind of touch on what Jamie's saying, a, a majority of um, the trade um, in things that people want to consume um, happening prior to the great upheaval era is kind of happening on the down low sort of legally there's a lot of smuggling uh, because of the inability of the english to really enforce their navigation acts um, in places like scotland and ireland uh, and in the, in the netherlands um, due to ships sailing under things like false flags um, which of course is a dutch innovation to get around english laws um, there's also the broader problem of scotland has a land border with england and so for a lot of the 1660s, 1660s, 70s, and 1680s, one of the major concerns of the English government, at least, is preventing goods being smuggled over the border into place into ports in England without paying the king's tax or, or whatever levy they're putting on it. Um, and I've had a theory for a little while that I, I will confess that I haven't written about, but um, one of the main engines of Anglo-Scots Union in the early 18th century is as much about gaining Scottish soldiers as it is about bringing a lot of this illicit trade under control, sort of harnessing it in the service of the British uh, Treasury, the Exchequer, um, rather than um, essentially allowing uh, Scots who are uh, in some ways unique, uh, uniquely capable of undermining English laws. They're English speaking, they're Protestant, they're white. You know, they can pass for English people if uh, someone living in the, the Caribbean or uh, the New World doesn't really know the difference, um, or even in parts of Africa. Um, they're maybe uniquely capable of doing so. And so bringing them under the English auspices, putting them under a British flag, making them pay the requisite taxes um, was a major part of the motivation for bringing the two countries together. Part of the reason I think this is that one of the first things the British government does after the union is massively increase the duties that the ships pay in ports like Glasgow. Um, uh, almost immediately, the taxes go up on incoming goods. So um, there's an argument, I think, to be made that um, we're seeing not just the increase in consumerism, but a greater regulation and control of it um, by states, by empires in this period. We're moving from an era where things are maybe a bit more chaotic in the early part of the Great Upheaval era, the 1670s, 1680s, towards a more, uh, I don't want to use the word mercantilist, but a more sort of state-controlled, state-regulated commercial world that the British in particular, but um, uh, uh, the Dutch attempt to do this as well, can control with a little bit more, uh, I guess, consistency. So great. Um, I'm just going to address, uh, there were a couple of sort of specific uh, source questions about our, our collections that might at least highlight, you know, some of the challenges we face. Um, and so, uh, receiving questions about the sort of various deeds that MHS has or these uh, are these are these legal or fair? Um, and so this is one of those things where you know historians, you ask us a question like this, and it's like, well, how many historians does it take to change a light bulb? It's complicated, and so we're going, oh, what do you mean by fair, right? And so the question is figuring out, okay, so what does the deed say? What do the participants think it said? Do the participants' understandings of what happened remain the same over time? And so the uh, the sort of comp the, the, the short yet complex answer to questions of deed fairness is usually that oftentimes these documents represent different things to different people. And so sometimes the question is, did certain people consider 
the same interaction valid at the same time. And so my own work focuses on some of the collections uh, that the MHS holds, uh, these deeds, and how English speakers and Wabanakis express different arguments over time about what, in fact, had been agreed to. And so uh, for the purposes of this talk, I just sort of said uh, the early ones were not so bad compared to some other places, and that, that holds up. Uh, but I, um, most of the time, uh, historians like myself will be very reluctant to, uh, unfortunately, be able to give like a short answer about like, ah, yes, this was just a flat out good deed or something like that, right? Um, and so, and this goes to the nature of working with a lot of these sources from this era, right? Where uh, so many of the participants in these events did not leave their own uh, written versions. Uh, you have all of these, these complex understandings going on that might be lost. And so we are, we're forced to sort of uh, follow along with what these people are doing as best we can and, and piece it together. And so I'm, I'm very reluctant to say, ah, yes, the, the Francis Small sale was totally good or something else like that. Although we should add that these deeds like these are wonderful sources less for are they good and more about what can this tell us about who was in charge, how do people think about property or where they are. And I'm sure, you know, everybody else on this panel could say, yes, you know, I look at these ship's logs and it's not because I'm looking to see if the captain stole something, but because I want to see if he brought wine or slaves or if he, you know, if he did this or how many crew did he have or whatever else. And so it's figuring out these, these different things from it. Uh, and so I, I highly encourage uh, curious folks to check out the digital, uh, the digital collections at MHS for, to look at documents like these. So if I may uh, ask a question of the panel, if I don't see other, other biggies, um, uh, hearing, uh, hearing your colleagues today, uh, and since this, since this project has, has, has begun, uh, has listening to these different events around the early modern world changed how you think about the local area that you write about and study? Go for it, Craig. Sorry, I uh, I can I lost you for a second there. Um, short answer, yes. Um, I'm constantly expanding the way I think about. Um, what at the beginning of my research um, was, you know, the history of Scots in America and now has become, how do we redefine Atlantic history to the perspective of this small kingdom? Um, I think a lot about um, what Crystalline said about Virginia and the relationship between, you know, uh, Native American warfare and the stability of the region, especially because Virginia shows up so much at the end of this period for me with the tobacco trade. Um, and then a, a lot about um, piracy and smuggling. Uh, I, I've Actually, I'm still in the middle of it, Jamie, but I'm sort of um, working through something you wrote on this topic not that long ago, trying to figure out what I think the difference is for things that I'm writing. So for me, I, I think getting a perspective other than the one that I bring to the table on the topic reminds me of things that I may have overlooked because it didn't pop up in my sources, right? I did, there's not a lot about slavery in my sources. So, um, you know, uh, putting that into the conversation with the work that I do, thinking about ways I could look for it, uh, in places that I haven't maybe looked before is a big part of these conversations for me. And, and working on this project, Ian, I think has helped me realize that all the ways in which I'm thinking about this era changing. Um, slavery is one of the big ones. Native American relations is another. Uh, we didn't haven't talked about it as much today, but there's a lot more women involved in trade um, amongst the Scots after the British Union. And I've wondered about that. Like, were the Scots uniquely bad at letting women be traders? And it was the British who maybe civilize them on that front? I don't, I don't know yet, right? But it's these kinds of things that these conversations, these questions, these conversations create. So I think that's the beauty of having them. Hopefully that answers your question, but it's sort of, yeah. Um, I'll jump in if you don't mind. Um, yeah, very much so, uh, Ian. I think it has changed um, or it had opened up kind of some new ideas about how to think uh, about, about this topic. Uh, mainly hearing your paper and, and Crystal's paper especially, I realized that even though this is a time that's extremely polarized where the French and the English, right, are, are trying to really um, depict the other side as the, the, the troublemakers and, and, and the real problem here, everybody in French America and in, in English America during that time 
living with the same reality. Either they're they're living in the reality of constant native attacks, right, and and, and internal attacks from their enemies, or they're living in constant fear of a possible attack, and and that constant threat of rumors of violence of being taken away right and then spending all the other time trying to get people back is really this shared experience and it makes me also wonder um in the in the french historiography in the french atlantic historiography there's been a lot of emphasis on how unique the french are right through their diplomatic skills and through like the the, the unique nature of their alliance and success with with native americans and and in your paper, Ian, uh, provided some examples of other, you know, successful treaty, at least one, <laughs> um, that seemed like, you know, to, to kind of satisfy both sides. And and I wonder, really, this, this has mainly made me think about, can we think about the Great Peace as an anomaly during that time, or on the contrary, as an example of what everybody's working really hard to achieve? Uh, or is it, you know, is it just kind of obscuring larger, more important common processes that are still going on, that violence that I, uh, that I referenced a minute ago? So, yeah, it's definitely been um, making me think about, about all those things in new ways. I'll pop in. It's certainly the what I think of Virginia, and I was already thinking of Virginia broadly. Um, hence, Ian and I are collaborating on this endeavor. But I think of the you know William Byrd has his hand in everything, and so when I think about writing about Virginia, the the fact that the, he is involved in such a massive Atlantic slave trade, that he's involved in the indigenous slave trade, that he's involved um, in this consumer revolution and what's going on with his partners with Perry Lane in London during during this time uh, certainly influences me. But I also think of towards the la later end of uh, this time period, I think of people like Alexander Spotswitz, um, the Lieutenant Governor, who is himself the product of colonialism. He's born in English Tangiers. Uh, and he brings with him all these ideas of how he's going to rearrange the Virginia colony, how he's going to create uh, all these multiple colonial partners to bring to this great peace in, in 1722 at Albany and the ideas that he, he has, some of which he of course fails at. Uh, but when I in thinking about this and thinking about the, the various actors I try to remind myself to to think about just how many pots they have their hands in, um, and and trying to keep that in mind so that it, it ends up being uh, a little broad um, and with with broad strokes, but they're not existing within a vacuum by any stretch of the imagination. And so borders of what we think is Virginia or what we think is New England um, are certainly modern conceptions, uh, and that deals with race. Um, as well. And so what I think many of us are going to be trying to do in our essays is try to deconstruct some of those modern myths of the historiography uh, and to take things back down to what were contemporaries within this era thinking and feeling um, and how would they describe? Would they describe this as an era of peace and prosperity or what kind of terminology might they use? Great. Um, so to, uh, in response to the, the folks um, uh, who, who just went, you know, working with, with everybody here makes me think about my own work and certainly with Crystal and making me realize that yes, apparently 1722 was just a just big year everywhere and Crystal and I are the lonely people who, who insist that the 1720s are just the most fascinating decade ever. Uh, which I suppose Jamie might agree, um, but that's uh, it, very few early Americanists will say that usually. It usually gets short shrift. And so uh, however much I try, uh, my, the scope of my own work keeps getting bigger the more I talk to these folks. Um, and so 
because I, yes, it's absolutely right that these events around the Atlantic world and across the continent just keep bumping into each other. Uh, and there was a, a mention of race, and I'll just say, because there was a question as well, I suppose an important theme that this time period covers that we don't make a sort of big original intervention in, but is the, the question of race. And this is a time when ideas that we would understand to be uh, recognizable modern day racism are really uh, rising in, in new ways among European colonizers. And this is a complex topic that defies a, a short answer, but basically there's all kinds of debate about when uh, the different groups of early modern people who shared humanity's uh, willingness and ability to sometimes be cruel uh, began to target different groups of people for specific cruelty because they were a race as opposed to a different religion uh, or just ethnicity or, you know, or culture or something else. Um, and this great upheaval is definitely a time when uh, when these ideas of, of race, of inherent uh, qualities attached to sort of a couple of biological features really takes a more observable route. Um, but uh, it's diffuse and it happens everywhere. And so it's not, uh, again, something that while it's an important topic, it's not something that we can say was sort of directly tied to, to any one of these events. Although certainly events in the, the Chesapeake are often talked about in terms of inspiring a greater recognizable biological racism in Virginia among English colonists, for example. Um, and so uh, we have though a, I'm sorry. Um, so Jamie Rice wanted to mention, wanted everybody to know that the holdings of the MHS are relevant to this topic that we're talking about today, uh, especially the Pajatska proprieties, they're currently undergoing a large scale digitization project funded by the NEH, so congratulations, it's a very well-deserved award, uh, so to, to make these records freely accessible online to the public. And so anybody can access them and interpret the source materials on their own. Uh, the, unfortunately, well, I mean, the library has been uh, increasing, you know, for obvious COVID-related reasons. Uh, research, physical research has been limited anyway, and so this time is being used to digitize uh, these extremely valuable sources uh, to make them available for everybody in a way that will, that will aid preservation as well. So hopefully uh, in the winter of 2021, uh, school groups and students and everybody will have, uh, and researchers alike will have access to these, uh, these fantastic sources on the uh, main memory network and in the, in the historical society's collections. And so I want to make sure, Jamie, did you want to, uh, to, to, uh, to share a, a final piratical flourish of any, any ways that this project has changed your thinking. I don't want you to be not incorporated. Yeah, um, this project has, has gotten me thinking about the ways in which indigenous conflict has contributed to um, disruption of the consumer revolution and how, like in what ways were pirates a part of that? Um, because we we tend to just focus on pirates as as a distinct group and sort of off on their own, but um, they're dealing with indigenous conflict on a lot of these islands as well. So uh, this project definitely has me thinking uh, about broadening uh, who pirates are interacting with and how those interactions are affecting their work. So um, yeah. Well, thanks so much. So we're gonna try and, and stay very much within time. And so this volume is, uh, is as we speak, being assembled, this talented uh, team of scholars, as well as a number of others who weren't able to with us today, uh, talking about such things as the, uh, the rise of British naval power, the, uh, the Pueblin struggle for liberation in the American Southwest, the, uh, the so-called glorious revolution uh, that created the sort of parliamentary supremacy in Britain, uh, the uh, potentially the, the witch craze that swept, uh, that swept parts of the American colonies in the 1690s. So come for all of those things, but stay for the riveting historiographical interventions in this volume that will, that will transform how you think about early America uh, and uh, surrounding areas and their place in the world around us. I wanna thank everybody so much for coming. Uh, for, uh, for participating in these programs to the scholars as well as the staff and as well as audience members like you.
uh, anybody who has been thinking that they, they should take the plunge and become a member of the Maine Historical Society, this is clearly a great time to do that, uh, to help support programs like this one. And so with that, uh, Kathleen, do you, have, uh, do you have anything to say or are we gonna, are we gonna bow out? Just a, a thank you to you, Ian, and to all of our panelists who participated today. And of course, to all our attendees, thank you everyone so much for being with us and for your contributions to this great discussion. Uh, you can learn more about our programs and about becoming a member of Maine Historical Society, uh, opportunities for research in our library or for visiting our campus in our museum by visiting our website, mainhistory.org. Uh, so thank you so much again for being here, and uh, I hope that we will see you all back here for another virtual program soon. <laughs>